Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Michael Van of Sacramento State University, but please call me Mike. Today I'm speaking with historian Timothy Snyder, who is the Levin Professor of History at Yale University, and Nora Krug, a graphic artist, author, and associate professor of illustrations at Parsons School of Design. Her 2019 autobiography, Belonging, a German Reckons with History and Home, received substantial acclaim and was the recipient of the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award in Autobiography. She was named Illustrator of the Year by the Victoria and Albert Museum in 2019. Her drawings and visual narratives have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and Le Monde Diplomatique. Professor Snyder is a prolific historian of Eastern and Central Europe in the 20th century who focuses on the violence of totalitarian regimes. Together, they have published On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century Graphic Edition with 10 Speed Press in 2021. The book contains slightly updated text from Professor Snyder's best-selling 2017 edition, but gorgeously illustrated with Professor Krug's artwork. Uh, Nora Krug, Timothy Snyder, Tim and Nora, if I may, welcome to New Books in History. Thanks so much for having us. Glad to be with you. So um, before we get into the book, would you please tell us a little bit about yourselves? Uh, Professor Crook, Nora, um, let's start with you. Please tell us about your work, uh, your artistic style, and the subjects you explore in your books. So I actually have a background in documentary film. I graduated from undergrad school with a documentary about post-war Sarajevo uh, in the 1990s. Um, And I then decided to focus on illustration, which was another visual medium that I was very interested in at the time. Um, But to me, illustration has always been a tool to communicate. It's not always been about the medium or the, the joy of drawing, basically, but mostly it's been a tool to communicate ideas and feelings. Um, and um, another thing that I've always liked about it is that um, it has a very political history. So I think it's a very appropriate tool to communicate nonfiction political ideas. Um, and I, uh, as I started my career as an illustrator, I, I came to realize that I missed my documentary work and then thought about ways in which I could combine my interest in the documentary with drawings and started to work on a short, uh, on a series of short visual narratives about war, in particular people um, who are not really known to us because their lives were not exemplary enough to be heard about. I mean, neither were they, um, you know, for better and for worse. I mean, they were neither heroes nor um, major perpetrators, just basically people living in the gray zones of war. And I was interested in focusing on that on that group, and only realized after that um, the sub the re- the reason for why I'd been so interested in telling their stories was because I myself am German, and had been growing up in the shadow basically of the war and the memory of the Second World War in particular, and um, then created the the book Belonging about World War Two and my own German family history, which is a visual memoir about my trying to find out what my family was up to under the Nazi regime and trying to figure out um, what German identity means to me today. Uh, and so I've, I've stayed with this kind of work that's very much influenced uh, by uh, history um, and growing out of the sense that, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand the complexities of political conflict better through the work and also um, the consequences of what those conflicts do to us emotionally as humans and over the course of generations. And um, could I ask you for the title of that film? And is it, is it available? Uh, it's not available. Um, uh-huh. I've kind of uh, tucked it away in my, in my drawer. <laughs> it's a very old piece of, of work of mine, but I, I learned a lot from it. I learned about, you know, interviewing techniques and, how to combine images with with words, uh, all of the stuff that I still think about with my drawn nonfiction work. Right, and and how how do you describe your artistic style with your illustrations? Um, um, it's always, I mean, I usually try to leave that up to others, but I think uh, that I am very influenced by German expressionism, in particular those artists who have also done work on war, like Otto Dix and George Gross. Um, 
So that's that's just one example for the kind of work that I think that I'm inspired by. But it's uh, I find it hard to describe my own style. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Professor Schneider, uh, Tim, um, can you please tell us about um, your work? I mean, you've you're, you've published far too many books for me to list right now. I'm just going to say that. Uh, probably the most two most important books for me would be your 2010 Bloodlands uh, between Hitler, uh, Europe between Hitler and Stalin, and your 2015 uh, Black Earth: The Holocaust as History and Warning. Um, but would you briefly describe your intellectual trajectory and how you came to be uh, one of the world's leading es- experts on such um, dark periods of history? Well, I mean, Mike, you'll probably agree that it's it's a it's generally a bad idea to let people make past historical judgment on themselves. You know? <laughs> so I'll I'll come at this question sort of from from the sides and try to say a couple of things that I think might be might be relevant. Um, I'm I'm a Midwesterner, and so I have this identification with the underdog. But if you're honest about your identification with the underdog, then you're always looking for the next underdog, right? Like if so, I think a couple of a couple of formative moments for me when I was younger was when I was sent to ask my grandmother, and I'm thinking a little bit of, the, of this because of Nora's work. I was sent as a middle schooler to ask my grandmother about my family in the Second World War, because of course I did have quite a few relatives in that generation who fought in the U.S. Army or in the other armed forces. And my grandmother, at one point in the conversation, my grandmother, who was always very jocular and warm, and she turned at me with a very serious expression, which I don't think I'd ever seen before. And she said something along the lines of, you really shouldn't forget about all of those Jewish people. And I was, I was, you know, I was 13 and I hadn't really thought about that. You know, like the idea that the history wasn't really the history of me or, you know, that that wasn't the way to go about it. The way to go about it was to jump somewhere else. Right. And I think another form of experience was Dayton, Ohio in the 1980s. And, you know, the, as an adolescent, I had a lot of contact with Dayton one way or the other, in a way, which was a very tough part of the country then. And it was clear that there were other folks like, you know, I had, I had various things to complain about, whatever. Um, and I had this kind of underdog attitude, but there it was clear that there were other people who had a tougher time than I was, you know, like the African-Americans, I mean, in particular, who I ran into and in various connections in that part of my life. And then the second point I would make coming up from the sides is um, I was basically propelled from the Midwest into Eastern Europe. Like there was a kind of, there was a jumping off point, which was Providence, Rhode Island and, and Brown University, which I loved, but I, I, I wanted to study Eastern Europe and I did get to study Eastern Europe and I was my, my very, you know, Nora, um, you know, raised the stakes here by mentioning her first publication or her first big work. The first thing I ever wrote about my first publication was a study of the Soviet economy um, and, and, uh, and had to do with my predictions that it was going to come apart and the problems of the problems of monopoly and the transition to capitalism. And, um, and, and so like I, I, I leapt from like one place to another you know, by way of by by way of this travel to Eastern Europe, that that essay like won a prize, and I went to Moscow for the first time, and which made a tremendous impression on me. I mean, I caught I, I, the, the first time I went to Moscow, I was still going to the Soviet Union, and then I won a scholarship to to go to England, where I did a sort of doctorate, which allowed me to um to travel all around Eastern Europe, and I basically and then I failed to get an American job, which was a blessing. So, I from from the early nineties, the nineties, I basically spent in Eastern Europe. Which meant that I mean I had I had a doctorate and I, I called this sort of doctorate I had wonderful I had wonderful um, supervisors and and I and, and I had a tremendous education but a lot of that education was just was the freedom to live and work in Warsaw and in Prague and in Vienna and to spend lots of time in Kiev and Minsk and Vilnius and other places and it was that experience which stands behind the two books that you were kind enough to mention um, Bloodlands and Black Earth which are of course scholarly interventions in the history of political atrocity but they also have a lot to do with intuitions about territory and those intuitions about territory arise partly because I just spent a good deal of my life, my young formative life in the places that, that I was writing about. So I had I, unemployment was kind of a lucky break for me in that, in that sense. And then the other thing I wanted to add was that in Eastern Europe, I mean, one of my survive one of my supervisors was, um, was a Holocaust survivor, which only kind of 
became an important part of our relationship later. What was important early on was that he was also an intellectual, someone who was sent to a camp under communism. And a lot of people who influenced me, you know, dead or alive, were like that. They were scholars who were also politically involved. And that model, you know, was natural to me. I didn't really know any other. You know, I never went to an American university. I was never, I mean, as a graduate student, I was never professionalized in that way. I'm st- still probably not professionalized in that way. And I think that has a lot to do with with the origins of the book that we're talking about, because the people I admired, I mean, some of the people I, some of the people I knew and admired are in this book, um, but the general idea that you could do scholarly work and sometimes slide into public involvement, public engagement when it seemed necessary, like that was part of my education. That was, that was normal to me. Great. Um, well, uh, <laughs> You're quite the success for claiming to be not properly professionalized. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, so, like, just just yeah, think of yeah. what I would have done, <laughs> just, what, what, what you could have been. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. feel like I got the best of both worlds. But thank yeah, you. yeah, and that must have been fabulous for language acquisition at that stage in your career. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that was because I didn't. Career, I, mean, I, mean, I didn't. I didn't properly study languages. Like my parents were bilingual yeah. in Spanish, um, mm-hmm. but. I didn't properly study languages until grad school. Unfortunately, yeah. graduate school involves spending a lot of time in other countries. And yep. so it's basically the like the fact that I'm an obsessive reader and the fact that I have very patient friends, that it's to that that I owe my language acquisition. <laughs> yes, here's here's to patient friends. Well, so you've you've touched on this already, but can you tell us the origin story of the original book? Um, on Tyranny is unlike the rest of your publications. Um, it's it's much slimmer, and it's also not geared uh, for an academic audience. It's um, it's written for the general public. Um, who did you want to reach with the book, and for for what purposes? Yeah, I mean the 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 origin story. I'm glad you asked it that way because, of course, the origin story involves everything that happened up to that point, right? As we know, you know, I mean the the way that communication is structured in the 21st century, things that happen are supposed to be related only horizontally to other stuff that's happening right in the moment. Whereas on tyranny is a compression of everything which happened up to that point. You know, it's it it doesn't it wouldn't have arisen without bloodlands and without black earth, and it wouldn't have arisen except for the fact that I thought I was almost, I thought I was done with another book, which was called the road to, which eventually was called the road to unfreedom, Mm -hmm. um, which came out in 2018. But in 2016, I thought I was almost done with it because it was supposed to, it started out as a book about Russia and Ukraine with only a kind of epilogue about the U S. And then I realized in 2016 that, um, that the U S and Britain and for that matter, European union had to be an essential part of the book. But what that meant was that I was already, I was writing about, about, about contemporary authoritarianism, you know, all, that was already, I already had that in mind. Like a lot of the stuff that's in on tyranny, I plucked from the road to the road to unfreedom. So everything I was working on in the past come, comes into the book. But then, you know, the, the moment when I decided to write it was when I was in Scandinavia, I was in um, Sweden talking about black earth, actually talking about black earth in Sweden and Finland and, and Denmark. And I caught a flight back, I think from Copenhagen, um, the, the night, the day, or two days after Trump won. And I I was then into my mode of like, what can I do? You know, what can we do? And that's when I, that's when I started writing the lessons down um, on a, on a napkin, which now hangs in a museum next to like Nora's or in an exhibition hall at the Documentation Centrum in Munich for National Socialism next to, it's like, it's like dwarfed by all of Nora's art. There's like, there's Nora and then there's like a, then there's a napkin, which I think is sort of wonderful. Um, And, uh, and, but, but but the origin is like slipping, you know, slipping from one mode to the other that I talked about. And I think, I think we have these, you know, I think that's my feeling at the time was you have to bring what you've got. And lawyers can bring one thing and, you know, physicians can bring something else. But what I could bring was history. And so I tried to bring it. And and I think, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed to communicate with other people, right? Like that's also part of our job is to communicate. And I don't happen to think that anything that we do is actually that difficult to communicate. You know, I think a lot of it is our, is our cowardice, right? A lot of it is our hesitancy to actually be understood. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so and that's a, that's a really, you know, that's a kind of banal form of cowardice, which we can, at certain moments we should throw away and just try to be, try to be very clear. So I wanted to give the book away. You know, my idea was to just write it and just give it away for free. Um, but, but, um, but my, my, it was my, my, pub, my, my editor at the time, Tim Dugan, 
who came up with the title on tyranny um, and who, who also said, no, we sh- you shouldn't do that. We should actually make this a proper book and give it a proper format. And that's why it had. That's why the original edition had that very simple, you know, that very simple format. It was actually very inexpensive because we wanted it to come out instantly and be like accessible to everyone. And that's so. That's that's the origin story. Yeah, and and I really applaud you for um, engaging in such much more public facing scholarship and, and and outreach. I mean, I've tried to do experiments with that in my career, and you know, sometimes there's professional um, blockages to that. Um, Retention, tenure, promotion committees don't always uh, appreciate such such work in the same way. Um, so, as the title tells us, on tyranny is indeed twenty specific lessons for the twentieth cent- from the twentieth century. Rather than reading through them all, um, what are the most important points you wanted to make with the book, and the most important advice or the most important lessons? Uh, I mean, I think the uh, the underlying point is that history is there to instruct us and in some way to calm us. So nothing. So the, the, the paralyzing feeling is that what's happening is shocking because it's unprecedented. But historians know that nothing is entirely unprecedented. And if you can just somehow carve out for yourself a moment to think, you'll start to see some patterns. And then from the patterns, if you look at how the patterns were read by people who are smarter than you, um, you can then read from the pattern some lessons. And so that that was that's the conceit of on tyranny. I mean, that I'm taking Americans, that was my intention. I mean, other people ended up reading the book and using it, but I'm trying to take Americans back into the, to, to history, which they are they know they're supposed to know, Stalinism, um, fascism, and and then into the thoughts of people who faced particular challenges and and then draw lessons from what they said about those challenges. And, and, and so the, if you, the, the lessons are, are in a kind of logical order, you know, the, 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 if you, you can read them chronologically, that is things get worse as you go through the book and the lessons get more drastic. Right. And unfortunately that chronology, um, as Nora has been kind enough to say other times, like that chronology mapped on pretty well to what happened in the four years after the book was written, but there's also a logic to it. Um, a psychological, or I'd prefer a moral logic. The first lesson is the most important: don't obey in advance, because if you if you do obey in advance, like if you if you normalize the situation, then you'll just keep normalizing. Whereas if you if you if you distinguish what's happening from your own sense of normal, um, and don't allow your automatic adjustment mechanisms to function, then you have a chance to follow the other nineteen lessons. So that's the that's the most important to me. Like the which ones other people remember and which ones I get asked about the most or is, is a different question, but that's the one that's most important to me. Which, which one do you get asked about the most? The one, and this is like, this goes right to the heart of, I think a lot of the things that Nora very successfully does in the graphic edition. The one that I get asked about the most or the one that people say struck them the most is make eye contact and small talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause that, that goes to, the inherent corporeality and the inherent, the inherently communal character of democratic politics. And which is, which is something which was slipping away from us half, you know, half invisibly as all this other terrible thing, all the other terrible things were happening. And then when you put it positively um, and, and, and say, okay, what's life? Remember, remember what life was like when we were not, we weren't just looking at screens the whole time. Um, And, that remember what you know. Remember what those. Remember what surprising conversations are like. That really struck people. I mean, that's the thing which caught people more than anything else was this notion of corporeality, which also figures in a couple of the other lessons. So the original book was a huge success. Um, why did you want to put out this graphic or illustrated edition? I think, I think like serendipity is really important, and you know it's. It's it's important not to make too much sense of your own life and artistic <laughs> scholarly decisions. You know, in this case, I did have in the back of my mind the experience that when I wrote on tyranny, I mean, at first I was having a much easier time getting to people who remembered Nixon, you know, and then I was having an easier time getting to people who remembered Reagan. And it was kind of, I remember, I kind of remember the moment 
you know, cause I, cause I, I had like, I had dozens and dozens of public engagements about on tyranny. It was all I did. I mean, when the book came out, I was literally carrying around my backpack and giving it to people um, on the street, like in the gym, you know, and, and, and then, and then I got invitations from synagogues and churches and, and local political groups and all kinds of activists and colleges. And, and it took me about, it took me about six months to find my groove with like kids, young people who were not my students, right. Who didn't have to listen to me. And so I did have in the back of my mind, like there must be a different, I, there must be a way to, to get after this generation. That was in the back of my mind, but that's not really why it happened. I mean, the reason why it happened was not that I was looking through the graphic edition. The reason why it happened was, was Nora's book, Haima, um, or belonging. Because when I, when I got, when I got belonging, um, I, I, I opened it. It's like one of these, you know, I opened it and I read it and I thought, okay, this is the person who should illustrate on tyranny. That's how it happened. Right. So it's not that, it's not that I was kind of auditioning for this. It's that I found the person whose sensibility I thought could was appropriate for the book. Um, and then, you know, and then I basically <laughs> invited her to lunch and she had no idea what I was going to ask her about. And I just basically <laughs> propositioned her with, with, with on tyranny, which she was, she, she handled very, very graciously and very, and very um, gracefully and more importantly, affirmatively. Um, so it's not, so, so Mike, I did, it's not that I had this grand plan. It's more that I, I, I came upon this very appealing and slightly alien sensibility of someone who was doing work, which was in some way similar to mine. And I thought that's the sensibility that I want to have around, around my writing. Great. So, um, I was going to ask, uh, Nora, um, <laughs> how you got, uh, got into this project, but so we've heard that version of the story. I mean, what, were you familiar with, um, on tyranny before this, uh, this lunch meeting and what was, what was sort of your reaction? What were your initial ideas for, for this project? I was familiar with Timothy's work, uh, in particular Bloodlands, and then he, after our conversation, I or was it before? I can't remember. He uh, he sent me on Tyranny, and that was the first time I read that book, um, and immediately liked it, of course. And um, I think what Timothy just pointed out is this uh, similar sensibility, and I think um, we have really um, very similar goals. And I think the main goal is clearly. Um, to think about how you can get people to realize that um, the history is not a thing of the past, but that we are made of it and that we have a responsibility. And I think in very different ways, our work centers around that question. So it, uh, to me, it also felt obviously like a very good fit. I mean, I was very flattered to be asked. Um, and um, I... Uh, also saw it a little bit as a continuation of the work I'd been doing before. Um, and uh, in particular at that time, I've also been living in the United States for almost 18 years. So, and I'm an American now as well. So I, um, I felt like I had to do something about the situation we were in. Um, as Timothy approached me, we were living through, you know, the Trump years and I felt a strong urge to do something about that. Um, with whatever tools I had available and that in my case is drawing. So, um, I already asked you to describe your artistic style. Um, and you were, you said you'd like others to describe it, but what sort of style did you decide to adopt for this book? What, what genre, what kind of images did you want to use? It's a, it's, um, I think someone described it as almost sort of a scrapbook style, a collection of both, uh, found images, photographs, and also original art. So could you could you describe your artistic choices? Yes, what was very important to me from the beginning uh, was what was clear to me that was that I didn't want to uh, make it a traditional um, graphic novel in the sense that I didn't want to work entirely with panels and speech bubbles, even though I admire a lot of the work out there out there that does that 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 does work in that way. But um, I wanted to free myself from what I thought were certain restrictions when using that kind of format. So I wanted to approach it in a, in a freer way and in a way that I hoped would be surprising to the reader whenever they turned the page. I wanted to, um, I wanted to leave them with a different feeling or a different um, uh, yeah, e emotional, emotional reality, basically. So I... Um, I decided to mix the styles, mix different ways of working together. Uh, one 
uh, one element are my my own drawings, but I've also, as you just pointed out, used uh, found graphic materials um, and historic photographs. Um, partly because I wanted to say something about uh, fragmentation and the fragment fragmentation, uh, the fragmentary way in which our own memory around historic events uh, often works. Uh, you know the way in which we put together individual pieces uh, to form a whole that makes sense to us in retrospect, but also to look at history um, as a series of individually experienced moments rather than something that moves chronologically from A to Z. Um, and I also wanted to show uh, that tyranny is timeless and um, also does not relate to just one particular place um, on on the globe. So I wanted to integrate um, graphic materials that were taken from different cultures and different uh, time periods to show that this is that because part of what Timothy's book is so is so great uh, about is explaining how um, these patterns work or uh, helping us recognize patterns early on, patterns that can lead to catastrophic results if we're not able to recognize them and interpret them. And um, so it was important to me to to bring in these elements from different times and different places. And I'm also an avid uh, visitor of flea markets and antique shops and household liquidation shops. And over the course of the last uh, probably eight years, I've been particularly in Germany going around collecting personal objects, um, you know, that sometimes things that somebody, a soldier would have carried around in their pocket. One example is, for instance, a tobacco case made out of the aluminum of a crashed airplane by a German prisoner of war um, who uh, engraved probably with a needle uh, illustrations into the lid of the of the box. Um, those objects to me really um, say something about what it was like to live through these times in a very different way than a text would do. And so I think they can inform our understanding of history and how history uh, affects us emotionally uh, more than we tend to think. I think uh, I mean, I know there are many universities dedicate their spaces and time to, um, you know, exploring visual, the meaning of these objects from a political and historical point of view. But I think not enough work has been done around how influenced uh, or how much we can these com these um, objects actually communicate to us. Um, and then also um, personal photographs. Um, so I, I integrated some of those. Um, and one example is right across from the title page of On Tyranny. I placed a photograph uh, of a man who looks directly into the camera. He has a, he has a beard and he has a, um, a piece of cloth tied around his upper arm. And um, I found this uh, amongst the photographs of uh, a German soldier's photo album that I just stumbled upon in West Berlin in an antique shop a few years ago. And um, presumably the person who's depicted um, was Jewish and presumably the photograph was taken by a German soldier um, and somewhere in Eastern Europe. And it was important for me to uh, juxtapose the title on tyranny with an image that shows the shadow image of what we often um, associate with images of tyranny. I didn't want to show the tyrant. I wanted to show the opposite face. You know, the basically it's, it's like a negative image of that word tyrant. And um, so that's just another example of how I've used found photographs in the book. Yeah. I, I also noticed that um, the, the, the way in which the text is laid out uh, reinforces certain points and sort of uh, gives these visual breaks for emphasis. Um, did you? I, I assume that you also designed the text layout for each page? Yes. Um, so basically I went through Timothy's book entirely again when I started with the work and I knew that I was going to have one page, one illustrated page, available for each page in the original edition. So the illustrated edition is, is just bigger, which means that um, there's more space for images. But I knew I had roughly one page per page in the uh, original edition. And then I went through each chapter paragraph by paragraph and thought about how to best divide the chapters. And moments that seemed important in particular to me, I tried to highlight by sometimes I just put one or a couple of sentences on one page and then 
uh, more paragraphs on the next page. Um, but all this was basically just, yeah, it was just based on my own interpretation of the text. I mean, um, Timothy and I never really talked about that. He was very uh, gracious and open and generous in letting me do what I thought was was best. And so it was really my own interpretation of what I thought was important um, and what should be underlined. And then I also laid out the text on, on many of the pages. I uh, have the text snake around the images so that they build a visual unity. And um, what had has been written about my work in the past is that um, this forces the reader to to slow down. And I think that's, that's always good, uh, you know, when you talk about books that are about um, political subjects is to uh, to sometimes pause and think about what you're reading uh, in depth. And um, I think that sometimes that way of, of making the reading process more complicated helps potentially some readers to slow down and reconsider what they just read in, in a different way. Ab- absolutely. And there's there's one page where uh, you try, have to turn the book to the side and the other side, and then another page where you have to turn the book upside down to read the text at the bottom that's uh, that upside down. And, it, and it, it again, it makes you slow down. It reminds me a lot of um, Sven Lundquist's book um, uh, on the history of bombing that uh, forces the reader to move back and forth uh, over the course of the, uh, of the course of the text. And, and also I, I found your, the layout so reminiscent of um, Nick Susanus's work, uh, Unflattening, where he really calls attention to what the text is doing on the page and explains to the reader this is to get you to slow down and get you to adjust your focus in different ways and that's that the the visual is emphasizing what's being conveyed in the in the text so i i i thought it was really engaging and really i really enjoyed it i mean i Um, also wanted to imply um this idea that the reader him or herself is part of the processes that timothy writes about that we are all I mean, the decisions we make on a daily basis always affect the lives of others and always shape our history, even if they're minimal decisions. And we are usually not not aware of that fact as we go about our everyday lives. And so I wanted the readers to uh, to feel like they are they are you know they are playing a physical part in in creating change. I mean, for for better or for worse. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really successful in that regard. And, and again, I. I just love those experiments with the layout of the text on the, on the page. Um, so we're speaking in November of 2021, four years after, uh, four years in, in change after the original publication, uh, of the, the first book. Um, Timothy, how was the book held up? Um, did it accomplish what you want to accomplish? Um, um, what, what might you change in future editions? It's a funny question because I mean I wrote it I wrote it all in a rush. Yeah. And yeah. that you know that itself is part I think of the of the of the vitality and also the vulnerability of the book. You know, it's not it's it's not a book that generally that, that people come away without some reaction to and I I think it's because in that in that moment, you know, in the six weeks between when I first wrote the lessons and when I finished the book, um, I was, I was in a, I was in a, I was in a, I was in a mode of, of, of trying to make something perfect, but very quickly. And, and so it was, you know, going back to some of the points that Nora was making, I was, it was meant to be both out of time and very much in time. You know, so I, I refer to, I refer to Plato and Aristotle, you know, and I, I, I and I, I, I take I take some examples from here and there. That the the, the the central point of focus is communism and fascism, but I'm 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 after fairly general human weaknesses and human self deceptions, and as 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 Nora said, the point was to help people find themselves. In, in in a political structure or in a political moment rather than losing themselves in a political structure and a political moment. And so the writing was, you know, the writing was drawing from these big powerful examples and exemplars that was also meant to not leave the reader anywhere to go. It was meant to, you know, meant to help the reader see 
in a hopefully in a helpful, instructive way, and even in a hopeful way, that there isn't an escape where you're in this moment and everything you do one way or the other is going to matter. And so here's some here's some instructions about how you can do things that actually do matter um, with your body, with your choices about time, with the way that you communicate, with things that might seem might not seem like they're political. I the as I alluded to before. I mean, in the in the beginning, there was this kind of, you know, shouting into the darkness where people came down pretty. I mean, some people came down pretty hard on the attempt to talk about you know history <laughs> and to make what people were pleased to call comparisons. Whereas, like the whole for me, the whole comparison thing is missing the point because, like, when you compare, you're saying like, here's an apple, here's an orange, right? I mean, comparison is an act of of making an analytical distinction between two things. Whereas what I'm writing about is history, right? It's, you know, it's, there was only one history to talk about Nazi Germany. Isn't to make a comparison. It's to refer to something that happened and some, and anything that happened could happen, right? Anything that happened therefore leaves some kind of instructive legacy. So the whole note, like as soon as people bring up the word comparison, it's like it, that itself is a way of cutting yourself off from history, you know, from life itself. It's like, it's a protective device. You're wrapping yourself in, you know, you're wrapping yourself basically in tinfoil. Um, and, 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 and so, and then people, and then a lot of people, you know, didn't necessarily criticize me, but were puzzled because they were sure that the institutions were going to save us. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I mean, you asked about the most important lesson before, and I said, number one, there's a reason why defend institutions is number two, because that I was sure was going to be the main American reaction. And it was like, oh, we're a democracy. We're a Republic. We've got these institutions. It's going to be fine. And of course, that is a self that is a self destructive or self oppressive attitude, because the moment you think the institutions are going to save you, you're taking your own vitality away from the institutions, and the institutions only exist in so far as you're investing yourself into them, right? So the whole mo- the whole move, the institutions are going to save us, is actually moved towards tyranny, right? And so, uh, so at the beginning, you know, I was having these kind of these fairly predictable arguments. I mean, I say predictable because they're actually anticipated in the pages of the book. I was doing my best to handle them in the book, but I don't mean to complain. I mean, the thing, the thing did very well. I think it was, I think it was like a number one bestseller every year, the Trump administration. And also in January of 21, like it did reach, it reached a lot of people. Um, And then, you know, most importantly, it kind of, and surprisingly, and like in some sense, my my work together with Nora is an, is an episode of this. It immediately became non-American. Like there were immediately bootleg translations into Russian um, and a bunch of other languages. And the bootleg translations were then followed by real translations. Um, and so I found myself in... It, it, I found myself like physically in other countries listening to my words being like, I'd be at a protest, literally at a protest. And here's someone reading from my book, right. In another, in another language. I thought, okay, wow, that's a really nice inversion. Cause here I get to just be the protester, just doing something, you know, and the words are out, the, the words are out there doing, helping somebody else do their work, which is organize, organize the protest. Um, so I know that it's made a lot of difference to a lot of people because I've just heard from a lot of people about it. You know, it's like much of my life in the last five years has been communicating with people about this book and how, like, which lessons are important to them and how it's changed some corner of their life. So I, and then, you know, there, and then there were other interactions, you know, more with folks who are more important in politics or for that matter in corporate life or non-governmental organizations who have told me that they read the book and that it changed some way that they were doing something. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm kind of humbled by it and I'm sort of glad at this point to be its vehicle, you know, and, 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 and glad that thanks to Nora, it's now, it now takes this better and deeper form than it did before. I tried not to change. I mean, what would I change? I tried not to change anything. You know, what I did change was I, I took out some of the references to 2016 and I replaced them with a few more general references to history and a few things that brought us up to 2021. I, I added specifically the concept of the big lie in reference to Mr. Trump's um, treatment of the 2020 election. That's a term that I deliberately brought into the American political discussion in November and December um, and January of 20 and 21. And um, I think it, it, I don't think it fits very nicely in with the other allusions to, um, to, to German history, which I was making. And then I put in some predictive material about the difficulties of the 2022 and 2024 elections. Um, so that, that's all I changed. I didn't really want to change much. I mean, I didn't change the lessons at, at, at all. 
And partly because I don't really think it's like, I, I don't really think it's mine to mess with at this point, you know, <laughs> like I, giving it to Nora, I was adding another dimension to it. And now it's, and, and now it's just a much, it's a different kind of book now, but I didn't really think it was mine to mess with. You know, like these lessons are like people may have made art with these lessons. Like people in Hong Kong have put these lessons on posters and on the subway. You know, pe- like people have taken, people have filmed themselves with these lessons before going to prison. Like they're not really mine to mess with anymore at this point. So I was, I tried to, you know, I tried to limit myself with with any changes that I would make. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the the global appeal. I mean, you 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 are an expert in Eastern and Central European history, and the examples are are drawn from that. Um, I my work has been the French colonial empire and increasingly Southeast Asia, and so I was reading this with the eye of a, a Southeast Asianist, thinking about Indonesia, thinking about Cambodia, thinking about the Philippines, thinking about more recently uh, Thailand and the junta, and. Um, you know the uh, so it's it's found an audience in Hong Kong. You said has it? What other parts of the world do you know that it's it's found an audience? Any? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, the, the Germans are always re- reliable consumers of you know, this sort of thing, <laughs> and, and reliably, you know, reliable dis- reliable interlocutors. It, it sold a lot of copies in Germany. It sold a lot of copies in the UK. But in terms of in terms of where I hear from people. Um, it's, it's kind of been everywhere. Yeah. Um, I mean, so you know, just stay with young people, student organizers in, in Thailand, um, student organizers in Turkey, Brazil, um, and then Chinese students all over the world in some in China, some studying abroad, um, a few of them, I'm pretty sure, are provocateurs. Although my nose from that is not as good as it is with the East Europeans. You know, like we all, we all like, we all have a better feel for that kind of thing in our own region. Um, but, but a lot of a lot of Chinese, a lot of young Chinese people, interestingly, have reached out um, and and talked about the book with me. Uh, you know, it, it was used. It's been used pretty broadly in Poland. In protests, a lot of reading aloud in Poland, um, and uh, it and it's been the, the lessons have been kicked around a lot in Russia, as well, both before and after the book. I mean, the, for understandable reasons, the published book has a harder time in some countries than in others, but the it's the the lessons themselves have been kicked around a lot in 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 Russia. So it's been countries that I knew, and then also places that I don't didn't have any particular like Hong Kong. Like it's been a bestseller for years in Hong Kong insofar as that has any meaning. And that's not a place that I, you know, know anything about personally, but I know, you know, thanks to, thanks to students and journalists, I, I then got a sense for how it made, for how the book worked for them. And in that way, I learned more about Hong Kong and about China for that matter. So that part's been, I mean, that part's been humbling because it's kind of been, I mean, Iran, right. There's an illegal edition in Iran. Um, there's, there are other, illegal bootleg editions in places where the book couldn't be published. And, you know, that's, that's touching in a different way. Cause like people are taking real risks, not just, they were taking the kinds of risks they're taking anywhere, but then they're taking real risks on behalf of this text. So, yeah. That, that must be an incredibly uh, personal and professional sort of meta moment to have, to have studied the Soviet Union to have studied um, Nazism and then to find your work going into a, a new form of the Samis dot press and being circulated in the underground, just as I'm sure you've, you studied earlier documents uh, traveling through the underground. Well, it reminds you, I remind you that ideas matter, but it also reminds you that transmission matters. I mean, the yes. whole in, in Samis dot, like a whole lot of Samis dot was actually pretty boring, but, <laughs> the important thing was the people who communicate, like it's not inherently interesting. It's not inherently interesting how many people were sent to one camp one week, but like the effort that people went to, to convey that information, that's really interesting, right? Because that itself, that itself conveys a a, a commitment to a certain kind of small truth politics where we're going to take risks on behalf of words because we think we think that's going to make a difference that's how we're going to lay ourselves out right and so as the person who came up with some of these ideas you know 
what I what what I realize, you know, what I'm reminded of again and again is how much more important it is to have people out there who are taking real risks, right? Like my ideas might help them, and that's wonderful. But the actual pra- you know, my book is meant to guide Americans into practices which are maybe a tiny bit riskier than what they would ordinarily undertake. But then I'm constantly being humbled by the people who are taking much greater risks, right? I mean, my life, you know, my life about since this book has been about Poland and about Slovakia and about Belarus, right? About places where people have been taking greater risks in slightly in slightly or much more tougher circumstances. And um, you know, insofar as the book is used by them, that's a kind of meta affirmation, Mike, of like of the idea that it's of the idea that it's um, relatively simple things being transmitted, relatively basic home truths about politics being transmitted that can, that can make a difference. But like, I didn't come up with that. You know, I, I, I plagiarized that from anti-communist dissidents of the seventies and eighties. And then, then it's taken back again from me by others, right. Who are doing the real work. Yeah. And although I I do think maybe you're being a bit humble, if you had found yourself in a bar with a bunch of proud boys and they figured out you were the author of on tyranny, that could have been a risky situation, I would imagine. Um, so I'd like to ask you a somewhat personal question, if I may. Um, I'm someone who works on the, the history of violence in colonial and Cold War Southeast Asia. And and recently, we've had a number of discussions uh, with other scholars of genocide about being tra- traumatized by our research and also how to advise our students who are working in such potentially uh, traumatic research areas. Um, what, what are your techniques for, self, I don't know, self-care for... Um, for not falling into the darkness uh, when dealing with some really horrible aspects of human history? I don't have a good answer to that question. Yeah. I really don't. Um, I don't have a good answer to that question. And, um, and I feel in some sense that if I did, it would, whatever, if there were a good answer to that question, it would have to trivialize what we do, you know? Mm. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I try to do all the things other people do. Like I try to be a, you know, I try to fulfill the other roles in my life. Well, um, and I have this, and I have this general idea that, uh, I mean, in, in writing the more, the more traumatic, you know, bloodlands and black earth, I had the idea then that it, it doesn't, it doesn't actually directly address this, but I had the idea then that I was doing the thing that I should be doing, you know, which doesn't directly, it doesn't address exactly what you're saying, but it is, and it's not even a consolation exactly, but it is, it is at least a truth, you know, like I it's, felt it's like a, sen- a sense of purpose, I think yeah. helps us yeah. with these, t- with difficult yeah. topics. Or like a, of, of, of some kind of duty, you know, like yeah. this yeah. is what, like, this is what is in our field, you know, like with Bloodlands, like it was, that's what is, you know, Bloodlands was what was in our field, in my field this time. And you know, nobody could really write about it who wasn't a historian of, of, of a big region of Eastern Europe. And, you know, it, and nobody could really write about it who didn't know both Russian and German. And, you know, and there were, there were definitely historians who went before me and write and wrote similar kinds of books, but there hadn't really been a book about all of it. And it was right in the middle of my field. Like it's like the center of my field, that the, the mass murder between 33 and 45. And the book wasn't there. Right. So I felt like if I didn't do that, then I'd be not doing something that I should be doing. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't make you feel great. You know, I don't, I actually don't think there's an answer to your question. Really. Been really generous with your time. Uh, but before I let you go, I've got two questions for, uh, for each of you. Um, first, can you recommend two books you'd want the audience to read? Um, Professor Snyder. Well, that that's, to, I'd be happy if like, if we all had time to read two books, you know, that, that'd be, that'd be great. Like, I'd just like to wish everybody the time to read two books. I, my, I, have, a, I have this general idea that, 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 that reading novels is drastically underappreciated and that novels are very important for, um, for the political imagination, you know, like in that stretching. It's also very, very important, like for historians, very important for our craft, you know, for our ability to plot and for our ability to imagine. Um, so I, I, if I could make it, I mean, it's not a particular book I know, but if I could make a general wish, I wish people would read more, more good novels. Um, you know, and for me, Julian, Julian Barnes would fall into that category of like, whenever a new book by Julian Barnes comes out, then I'm, then I'm happy, then I'm happy and excited. 
um, it, it, historically I've been, I've been trying, I've been because of on tyranny and because of Trump, I've, you know, I, it's been harder and harder for me to like say what I usually say, which is that I'm an American and a historian, but I'm not an American historian. It's been harder to pull that, you know, cause like people, people want me to be pronouncing on the U S. And so I've been trying to read a lot. I've been trying to read U S history and, um, not to ever claim to be a U.S. historian, but just to, you know, just to be, just, just to have some kind of baseline of competence. And so I would, I, I just mentioned a couple of books that I read um, for a class that I'm teaching now at Yale uh, by, uh, by my colleague, Elizabeth Henton. Um, uh, that one is called um, from the war, from the war on poverty, the war on crime. Mm-hmm. And another, another was called America on fire, which just came out a few, a few months ago. Um, which are both really good books, of, you know, getting to the heart, getting to the heart of, 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 uh, of racial politics in the U.S. Like non, you know, non naive, um, <clears throat> non, non naive, like non, um, non cliched, highly empirical, you know, um, highly empirical, but also persuasively analytical books. Um, both of them really about this turning point in the '60s and '70s, which now, in retrospect seems very important to where we are now in the country. So there you go. Excellent. Well, I, I applaud uh, your encouragement for uh, for us to read novels. Uh, all of my history students have to read a couple of novels uh, right on. For, for every class. And boy, do they, uh, do they whine about it. And boy, <laughs> do they appreciate it afterwards. Um, and, you know, wh- one of the classics I teach is, is right up your alley with the uh, Arthur Kessler's uh, Darkness at Noon, which oh, yeah. I think, you know, it still stands the test of time and um, should be taken as a historical document. But I think it's still still quite there. But um, uh, Nora. Nora, um, two books you could suggest? Yes, I mean, I agree with Timothy that there are so many uh, novels that teach us uh, an equal amount about life and how to confront confront ourselves and history um, as maybe history books do. But I do want to um, stay a little bit with the subject of this conversation and uh, recommend Victor Klemperer's diaries. Um, he was a German scholar um, and kept diaries for, um, I think, the majority of his life. Um, and what interested me in particular were, were the diaries that he wrote under the Third Reich. Um, he survived uh, the Nazi period and uh, was, uh, I think, largely because his wife was Christian. Um, and uh, what I found so fascinating about his diaries uh, is the everyday moments that you learn about um, the uh, you know the the history between the lines you know the the everyday encounters he had with friends or colleagues and how how all of that changed gradually um, through the through the years of the Nazi regime. And I think it really can inform our understanding about that time period on a very humane level very well. Um, another book um, that's worth mentioning is uh, Das Echo Lot. I don't know what the American or the English title is, by Walter Kempowski, another German author who uh, spent many years after the war collecting personal letters and other um, you know, photographs and other documents uh, that would speak to the um, everyday experience of the life under the Nazi regime. He, I think, at some point also put ads in newspapers asking people to send him whatever they had in their, in their attics, basically. And then he collected all of this material and put it into several volumes of books that basically... I mean, it's in edited form, but uh, feature those those letters and, and writings and photographs he received. And again, it's a fascinating um, perspective into the more, um, yeah, into understanding what it was like living through that time on a human on a human level. Yeah, excellent. Mike, can I can I say something about about this? Absolutely. I that that that, uh, that Nora's recommendation is actually one of the books that is cited in this book. So Klemper is very important to this book and his careful attention to language is one of the inspirations for this book. And I remember it as Nora was answering that this book, not to get too meta, but the book actually contains in, um, in, in lesson nine, be kind to our language. It actually contains a list of recommended books. And so I was, I was crimping um, um, from my own brain in 2016 
And there are a couple here that I would just I want to mention. I don't think we should end this conversation without mentioning Origins of Totalitarianism mm -hmm. by, by Hannah Arendt, um, which um, I think remains um, the, the, the broadest, most ambitious attempt to figure out just what had happened. And it's astonishing that the thing was you know, written as quickly as it was after the Second World War. And, and, I and if, I, if I could just interrupt, one yeah. third of that book is about imperialism, my main field of study, Ab absolutely. which, which that, so many of us absolutely. forget about. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, when I taught a class this fall, I taught a class called Hitler, Stalin, and Us this fall, um, a lecture class in which the first part of the first part of the class was about empire and in particular Africa. And obviously that was, yeah, I mean, obviously that was influenced by Arendt. And it was it was great for me also as an education to try to read into that field, right? Um, but but yeah, I mean that it's that part of the book actually which seems more relevant as time passes. Like I remember reading the book in the eighties as a student. I thought, okay, I'm just gonna like kind of, I'm gonna get to the part about totalitarianism, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I think there was there was there was even an edition of it which was published with just that part. Oh like no, just, they I, took out the section on imperialism. I believe that there was yeah oh. there was just yeah I think there is such an edition. Whereas now it's, it's like, I mean, the, not all the empire stuff, I have to say this as a professional historian, but it doesn't all hold up as history, obviously, but the insights about empire are really fruitful. I mean, she's basically using empire, you know, um, uh, following on Joseph Conrad, like, you know, she's, she's using empire as, as a way to get into these cold, dark insights about how we behave in certain situations. But then I wanted to mention a second book, which actually, you know, the title of which is actually a citation of Arendt, um, Peter Pomerantsev's book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, 2014, about contemporary Russia. That is, I think, I think that's the book which, you know, describes and foretells the, the, the what you could call post-truth politics, um, to my mind, better than any other. Like, it's, it's a portrait of Russia, but in this portrait of Russia... You see, you see, you know, you see just how far the certain logic of just of banishing, banishing factuality and values from politics can go. It's also just a beautifully written little, briefly written book. Um, so I cheated and I've just like jumped on and yeah. made a bunch more recommendations. Well, also I um, I applaud you for um, uh, invoking uh, Eugene Unesco's Rhinoceros, the the absurdist play you mentioned it in on tyranny and. That was really important for me as an undergraduate thinking about political development and and understanding how fascism can can sort of sneak in amongst us as everyone's turning into rhinocerai, rhinoceroses, whatever the plural is. Um, I'm not supposed to do this, but I want to give two plugs for two of my favorite novels directly related to this subject. Um, the recent translation into English of Hans Falada's Every Man Dies Alone, which is the fictionalization of a a working class couple whose son died on the Eastern front in world war two. And, and they engaged in low scale acts of resistance against the Nazi state, leaving little notes. And then, um, Vasily Grossman's gigantic life and fate, the Soviet journalist who does this, you know, the Tolstoy style portrait of, uh, of world war two. I found that I read that as an undergraduate and was really blown away by that. Um, what are you working on now? Um, uh, Nora, what's uh, what are you working on now? What can we hope to see from you next? Ideally, maybe a combination of another collaboration with somebody whose work I'm as you know <laughs> impressed by as Timothy's, and also a new book of my own. Uh, and I want to stay with a visual nonfiction, possibly war or other political conf conflicts in general. But one subject that I'm also very interested in, like you, Michael, is colonialism. Because I think, um, at least from a German point of view, this is something we don't nearly know enough about, that we don't nearly learn enough about, including uh, in the context of World War II history writing, um, you know, how the colonies were involved and how people who grew up in those countries were involved in our war. Uh, we never think about those things, even though the Second World War is a very important part of our German education but not from that perspective. And um, so that's a subject that I'm just starting to explore a little bit more for myself. Well, fantastic. As a, as a historian of imperialism, that makes me happy. And uh, one of my favorite little historical facts to throw out to my students is that the, uh, the khaki, the excess khaki uniforms from the defunct colonial empire were the surplus uniforms that the brown shirts picked up. Right. 
Again, I mean, ma nothing. material culture, visual culture, yeah. I and mean, also the history of the postcard is very interesting, yeah. I think, yes. in the context of German colonialism, you know, the photographs on the front uh, showing where you were, what, what land you had claimed, uh, and then whatever the person wrote on the back, these individual personal messages, I think these are all political tools that were, um, you know, we're often not really thinking about as, as political tools, but more as... Um, you know, something might, one might find at a flea market, yeah. but really disregard for its for its deeper meaning. Yeah, and I, I've I've actually worked on French colonial postcards, and there's a whole genre of postcards of executions and severed heads from Vietnam and from Morocco, and um, that is such an incredible insight into uh, colonial culture and and what and why why this image and then to put it in such a banal circulation, uh, such as a postcard. Um, Timothy Snyder, what, uh, what are you working on now? What's next? Well, like a lot of us, I've been, I've been working on my teaching, you know, I've been trying to <laughs> like, I, there's this, this class on Hitler, Stalin and us was an entirely or largely new lecture class. And I'm teaching a class on incarceration now, um, which is, which has been new and which I'm learning from. And, I'm teaching a couple of new classes in the spring about, about history and freedom. I've been thinking, I've been trying to make sure that I've been trying to make sure that like at this stage in my career and at this stage in our history, that like the teaching is fresh. And as you know, like this isn't going to press anybody who's not a university teacher or a teacher, but like doing curriculum is a lot of work, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of work if you do it thoughtfully. I'm writing all, all the time. I'm writing this book about called Brotherlands, which is about, how nations are actually formed. It has, it, it's, it's about the transition from the early modern to the modern period and about elite families who are important in a pre-national environment and how members of those families choose nationalities. So it takes in particular brothers and sisters who chose different nationalities with whom to identify and then became important in different, different national movements. And then, of course, we forgot that they were brothers and sisters because, of course, we, you know, in the backs of our minds, we really think nations are ethnic. Um, and so, so it's it's a it's it's a kind of like rewinding the history of the nation down to the point where it's actually starting through through these like really interesting family stories. Because apart from the dramatic choice of different nations, actually, that wasn't often the dramatic part. I mean, often the drama was somewhere else. It was in birth order or love affairs or 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 some something else. Um, so that's, I've been doing that for 25 years. So that's my, been my, that's been my next book for 25 years. Um, and it probably will be for a few more, but I'm working on it the whole time and I really love it. The thing that I'm trying to do now is, um, kind of an extension of, of what we've been talking about. I'm trying to write a book about freedom, which is not, which is not a history or even a kind of defense, but of a philosophical description, like a proposal of what freedom actually is. And what it would mean to be free people in this century. That's what I'm trying to do. And it's hard. You know, it's like, it's, it's a lot, yeah. it's harder than just defending and it's harder than just describing, you know, it's, it's, it's proposing, but, but, but I'm, 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 I'm enjoying that. That's, that's got me, that's got me really absorbed at the moment. Fantastic. Have you seen um, Tyler Stovall, uh, former HA president's uh, book, uh, White Freedom, The Racial History of an Idea? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that. So that getting at, so the, the, once again, I'm trying to write a book as an American for Americans and I'll probably <laughs> fail, right? Like, it'll be, but, uh, but one of the things that I, one of the things you have to do before trying to resuscitate that word, you know, as your question suggests is get at how it's actually used now, because when I look at it, usage in America, I mean, my, the first word that comes to my mind is Orwellian and, and so then you have to get, then you have to get at what are the, what are the structures and the traditions which allow the word freedom to be used in a way which not only deprives, not only, you know, takes away freedom from the obvious targets, but also takes away freedom from the people who are using the word, right? Because if your notion of freedom is that you belong to a tribal or a racial collectivity, which is doing slightly less badly than some other tribal racial collectivity, that's not freedom, right? Like that's that, whatever that is, you know, that's not, that's not freedom. I mean, it's, it's some kind of tribalism or as I like to think of it, Sado populism. Um, but it's not, it's not freedom. Like it's not, it's not the development of individual values and their realization in, in some future that you have some, that you have some individual control over. So like getting out from under the way we use the word freedom in American English and like trying to start completely fresh and just like, you know, to 
to, 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 to own the word in a different way, you know, to, to confront how much that word actually demands of us, right? Because one of the things we do wrong in, in this country is that we use the word freedom not only as a way not to be free, but as a way to not even think about what it would require to be free. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to do the opposite of that. I'm trying to make it a demanding word. But as you say, like the, there are American traditions that you ha- that you can't you can't slide by. Like you gotta you gotta direct address them frontally. And I'm trying to do that too. Well, look forward to that. Um, Nora Krogan, Timothy Snyder, thank you so much for talking with me. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you, Mike. So this has been a conversation with historian historian Timothy Snyder and graphic artist and author Nora Krug about On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century Graphic Edition, out with 10 Speed Press in 2021. I'm Michael Van of Sacramento State University, and this has been an episode of New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. Thank you for listening. <laughs>